My name is Elaine Herbert. I am a radiation therapist at Stanford Healthcare. I am also the, the radiation therapist curriculum lead for RCC. Thank you for joining us. And I can't believe that we're almost to the end of the course. This, is, this will be the, not the last session, but the last um, lecture with content. So today we're gonna talk about a culture of safety. All of my slides. If you're on the laser pointer, it might not work if you click. Is it because of the laser pointer? Oh, there we go. Okay, so, so far in the course, we have covered cancer and the role of radiation therapy in treatments. We've covered radiation physics, radiobiology, treatment planning, comparing the techniques of 2D, 3D, and IMRT, simulation, simulation and immobilization, imaging and the role of IGRT in, in the transition to doing IMRT or VMAT, and motion management. We've talked about all this complexity that the new technology brings with computerization, digital charting, digital imaging, MLCs, respiratory gating. All of this stuff allows us to deliver a very conformal treatment, which allows us then to escalate the dose to the tumor while sparing normal tissue. We have, these are very powerful tools that allow us to very precisely and carefully deliver a potentially lethal dose of radiation. So I want to emphasize in um, this session that, as Peter Parker's uncle told Spider-Man, that with great power comes great responsibility. So today, first, we're going to look at examples of errors that were mentioned in this New York Times article. And then in the second half of the lecture, we'll talk about preventing errors. So hopefully you had a chance to read the article in the New York Times. If not, um, no worries, we'll be discussing the highlights. When I read this article, it was it was very sobering to think about. Yeah, it was just a very, very good wake up call. One note I wanna say is that the errors that were discussed happened in 2007. And this was still early on in the adoption of IMRT. I started, I was in school in the early 2000s, around 2002, and clinics were just starting to adopt IMRT technique. So this was about, you know, three or so years. I don't, I'm not sure when these clinics started, implemented IMRT, but it's still early on in the technology. So the main, the main example in the article was this head and neck patient. So according to the article, what happened to the patient? Would someone like to share what happened to the H&N patient from the article? Feel free to raise your hand and I'll unmute you. Hello. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So according to that uh, article that you have shared, and in that actually the, the, the radiation oncologist try to improve the plan. So he asked the physicist to, I think that he want to reduce the dose on the on, on patient's teeth side. So, he asked physicists to physicists rerun the plan. And during that, that exercise, I think there was some, some kind of a crash, computer crash, and the planning system, something happened with the planning system, and the, the planning system removed the MLCs. So, so basically, I think two fractions delivered that patient without MLC. So, or... Uh, and in the third fraction, I think they noticed this thing that there is something wrong due to the enormous uh, swelling on patient's neck. Uh, so the physicist basically uh, rerun the plan and try to confirm or with, with the help of, I think, some, some another software or, and he, she realized that there is some, some problem and then he shared it with the uh, physician. I think so. That was the, the, the I learned from yes. that article. Yes, thank you. Yes, the problem was that the patient got treated the, with the open field instead of the MLCs moving during treatment. So he ended up receiving 13 gray per fraction, and the three fractions were a total of 39 gray, all to that whole head and neck area. They, yeah, as as we noticed in the article that they they didn't they didn't do a 
plan verification before uh, running the plan on the patient. And then also the therapist delivering the treatment didn't notice that the MLCs were not moving. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show a video. I, I know some of some of the clinics have not have not implemented IMRT. So I'm gonna just share what it looks like when the treatment's going. So during during BMOM, this is an example of the point and shoot, the MLCs move during treatment. So in this example, these leaves were at the maximum position. So this entire area was open field and that's what the patient received. Instead of having a very conformal dose, he basically got uh, blasted, which, is, which was quite unfortunate. Oh, let me go back. So this one question I want you to be thinking about is, as we're looking at these errors, is think about what if, you know, if, if this was me at that clinic, what could I have done or, or what could have been done to catch this error? So in this case, the plan, the treatment plan wasn't run on like a QA phantom to make sure that everything was okay, that the plan was going to deliver the dose expected. I don't believe there was a second physics check, which is standard in our clinic. And then also the therapist during the one, two, or three treatments didn't notice that the MLC leaves were not moving, or this would have been caught, you know, right when the first fraction was delivered. So the the importance, the take-home point for us in this example is as therapists, we need to know how are the equipment works. In this case, the MLCs should have been moving. And if we didn't know that that's what's supposed to happen during an IMRT treatment, we wouldn't know that something was wrong. This is an unfortunate, unfortunate accident. Okay, so in the, the other case that was mentioned, would someone like to share what happened to the breast patient from the article? Hello. Yes. Yes, so for the breast patient, it was a case whereby the wedge was out of, for all the treatment fractions, and the therapist only noticed that the wedge has been out on the second last fraction. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yes, unfortunately, this patient, because the wedge was missing, the wedge changes the way the isodose curves go. So it, she received too much radiation to the chest wall, the skin, the muscles, the ribs, and part of the lung. And unfortunately, unfortunately, she died as well. And the thing for us to think about is what would have caught that? And, and you mentioned that, that, yes, the therapist did not notice. And again, the, the emphasis I want to make is that, you know, for breast tangents as therapists, we should know that anytime there's a, a curvature in the, in, in the tissue, the, we want the isodose curves to be to adjust for that curve. So anytime there's a, a breast tangent field, there should be a wedge in the plan. And then we should notice whether or not the wedge was implemented in the treatment. So out of 27 of 28 fractions, there was no wedge. From the article, I think the these were this was probably with this was not a manually entered treatment, but it was electronic record and verify because the weekly chart checks they didn't notice that there was no wedge. And then also the therapist out of 30, 27 fractions didn't notice that there wasn't a wedge. So we'll go quickly through the other, the other errors and my slides won't forward. There we go. So other errors that were mentioned. So 90 prostate patients were given the wrong dose. So what could have prevented this? A number of things that we could have done, been done. I'm not sure where the error happened, but let's say the prescription was, the, the wrong prescription was prescribed. Something like a peer review would catch that. Or if maybe the, if the plan was set to a wrong, a, you know, a different dose than what was prescribed. Let's see. So peer review might have, might have caught, in that, caught that error or maybe a plan check to check if the plan is meeting the prescription requirements. And also if it was a case of incorrect MUs, the therapist could have maybe caught that. The article didn't say exactly why that happened. Another thing that was mentioned in the article was that the brain, some 77 brain patients were given more dose than prescribed due to machine miscalibration. 
I'm going to pause for a second and have you think about what kind of things could have caught this error. I want to raise their hand and think of how this could have been prevented. That might be a hard one. This is more in the um, wheelhouse of physics. We see that it happened over, over a year. And so the physicists are the ones that check the calibration of the machine. And so this is an example of a systemic error. There's something not correct in the machine. And so, you know, you think you're giving a hundred centigrade and you end up the machine is actually delivering 150 centigrade. So I would say in this case, maybe check the machine calibration more frequently. I don't know how often the centers do this. I want to take off the annotation. There we go. Another error, a missed target due to equipment miscalibration. This could be uh, maybe the lasers are a little bit off, or maybe if you're doing IGRT, your table shifts could be off. You think you're shifting two millimeters to match your image, but you're actually shifting five millimeters. And to prevent this every morning, we should check our lasers or check our OBI alignment. The, I don't know if this was because the ISO center was slightly off, but physics would also be checking the machine periodically to make sure that all of the alignment is correct. Another example that they found in the article was beam modifiers were left off, left out, wrongly positioned or misused. This could be like the wedge example in the article. Other beam, mod beam modifiers would be like bolus. Would anyone like to raise their hand to open their mic to mention how we could catch this, these kind of errors? Hi, this is Zaka. So regarding this question, I would like to share that uh, these kind of, excuse me, this kind of uh, errors actually we can catch uh, by doing the different kind of retreatment or uh, checks that we can use apply whether it's on the on the RTD side or it's on the physics side. So like uh, if chart check weekly and especially when when we are treating the patient before that before treating the patient it's good to have uh, a complete thorough check on the artery side as well as on the physics side and there must be actually a dosimetry uh, check of that plan and uh, that should should be in in some like matching with the actual plan so what what they have actually planned and what they received so these kind of checks i think it can prevent these kind of errors thank you Thank you. Yes, exactly. There, we've got to do checks all the way, all the way through the process. So like in the case of the, the, the breast patient we were just talking about, the plan was supposed to have a wedge, but somehow the plan was missing a wedge. So in the checking the dosimetrist at the, at the dosimetrist workflow or at the physics workflow, make sure that the wedge was in there. And also on the RTT side, the therapist side, when we, let's say it's a, a physical wedge or a physical bolus that we place on the patient before we leave the, the vault, after we've, after we've set up the patient, then we do our visual checks. Did I place the bolus? Did I place the bolus correctly? And then outside of the console, we're checking the plan before we beam on and checking, you know, does the plan require a bolus? Is it, is it every other day bolus? Is it bolus only on one field? Those kinds of things. So exactly those checks would have caught this kind of error. Before we continue, Hanifa, sorry if I'm saying that wrong, shared in the chat. Hello, everyone. I think overall what they might have done better was, was to watch one another's back and not assume it's not their job description to observe and report any form of error whatsoever to the necessary channels. Multidisciplinary approach cannot be overemphasized. The job of treating a patient qualitatively is dependent on everyone and each team's job description overlaps into the next professional's job description. Thank you, very good point. It's, you know, we're all in, the, we're a big team together and, you know, we are the last stop. So everything that happens upstream, we, we absolutely wanna check, not just say, well, that was their job. Yeah, good point. We're all, all of us are a team treating the patient. The patient got treated on their prostate instead of stomach cancer. I think I'll, I'll take that one. That would, that would be a check upstream, like you just mentioned. 
maybe check the consent. The patient's going to sign that, yes, I'm consenting to treat my stomach. So then when we make the, you know, the treatment plan or the dosimetrist or the physicist checks the plan or it creates the plan, they're going to check, oh, I guess I am making a plan for the stomach or am I making a plan for the prostate? Comparing with the history and physical, making sure the prescription and the consent and the H&P and the actual plan match with what we're supposed to be treating. Miss Target, I'll let you suggest how we check that one. If anyone want to open their mic and suggest how we could catch missing the target. Hello. Yes. So regarding this, like uh, missing the target, uh, nowadays actually, <laughs> in this uh, couple of years since from 2015 to onwards the machines that we are using for treating the cancer equipped with the very you know good kv imaging and also the mv imaging so on daily imaging can also prevent this so that especially those centers who have these sophisticated sophisticated machines uh, can actually target the volume on daily basis and remove the like the minor or minimum minor errors on daily basis or they can treat it like 100 percent accurately on daily basis but before if we talk like uh, those centers especially those have not these uh, opportunity to have these you know sophisticated machines and still working with the old machines on that centers i think there are some if they are they have paperwork so they can like utilize the anatomical stamps over there they can place the location of the tattoos these kind of things i think it's prevent the area that we are treating so or we can add the photograph of that uh, treatment area so these kind of uh, checks actually provoke uh, the arteries that where they want to treat or where the physician actually planned their treatment areas thank you Yes, thank you. Yes, with IMRT, we or IMRT or VMAP, we are so precise and where our margins are able to be so much tighter that IGRT is definitely definitely the way to go to confirm confirm our positioning. We could all in the case that if you don't have the technology to do IGRT yet, we definitely want to do visual checks. Like did I, does the laser, you know, are my lasers in the right, you know, isocenter? Is I'm treating a pelvis, are my lasers at the pelvis or am I in the abdomen? And with 3D fields, we check the light field and we have, a, if I haven't seen this before, I'm going to check the photograph and make sure the light field that I'm looking at on before I treat the patient looks like it's supposed to. And I compare it to the photograph. The anatomy looks correct. Yeah. Very, very good answer. Thank you. Hello, this is Vincent. What I wanted to say is, uh, you know, sometimes maybe if you are looking at the kind of prescription that uh, the doctor maybe could have written very wrong, but sometimes it's good to engage your patient when you are treating your patient. Because, you know, some patients, in a way, they usually give so that the ones who are treating the medical office are also right. But it is good also to engage the patient. When you engage the patient, you become like friends during treatment. And probably maybe during that kind of engagement, when you are setting up, eh, the patient can be able to notice, say that maybe where you are aiming and where the disease seems to be, they seem to be uh, some kind of mismatch. Eh? So sometimes it's good to engage your patient during setup, just check up on the patient, you talk, you know, and before you leave, if there is anything wrong, the patient can be able to notice. Because I've seen so many times say that you are setting your patient, and uh, maybe the two of you, you have been able to forget to put the bolus. Then the patient will ask, hey, there's something that you should put here. Where is it? Mm -hmm. so in such a kind of a man, and then you can be able also, the patient can be able to help you see where there's a problem so that you can correct it before you come out and be one of the patient. Yes, yes, that's a really good point. Sometimes the patients are afraid to, they're, you know, they, they're like, I'm in your hands and I trust you and they don't, you know, they don't think they can speak up, but, but it's good you build, you know, we see our patients every day versus like in other areas of healthcare where, you know, you might just see them once and then, you know, whatever, take care of their problem and then they go away. But in radiation therapy, we have that relationship with the patient and it's good to have the patient be involved in their own care. When we do high dose treatments, and this is, we also, well, 
One of the things we do when we are walking the patient into the vault, we confirm their identity. That's just, this is one of the requirements that we're supposed to do using two ways. So we ask them to say their full name and their birthday, and then we check on the console that that is the correct name. So we have the correct plan, the correct patient, but we do also ask, okay, what, what part of the body are we treating today? And, you know, they don't have to be specific about, I have a sarcoma. They could say, I'm, you know, we're treating my head or we're treating my leg just to make sure everyone's on the same page. We explain on the first day that we're going to be asking them these questions. And it's not because we don't know, but it's because we just want to make sure that we're all on the same page as part of our quality assurance process. And, and the patients understand they don't, they, they, we, what, why are you asking me? Shouldn't you know what you're treating on me? Good point. Thank you for bringing that up. Let's see. Another error that was mentioned in the article is that a multiple site treatment on a multiple site treatment, one site got too much dose and the other got too little dose. And it mentioned it was due to improper documentation. I'm guessing that this might've been maybe with manual charting and manual entry of treatment parameters. So I, I think, and it doesn't mention an article, but I think what's going on would be that maybe let's say it was a, they're treating a right rib and a left rib and they documented that they treated the right and, but, or I can't actually think of how this would happen. <laughs> Maybe it was that they thought that they treated the right side already and it wasn't written down. And then Maybe there was a shift change, and then so the ther next therapist treated the right side again. But I'm going to zero in on this improper documentation part. So to prevent an error in a situation like this, perhaps we could have a standard operating procedure for documentation, um, where everyone, you know, make sure you follow the correct treatment you know, workflow on how you document, so that there's no confusion. You should never be pre-charting if you're if you're doing manual charting. I'm not sure what that error was. Oh, patient received someone else's treatment. So how could we catch that? Feel free to raise your hand or open your mic. Hanifa said, by proper identification of the patient. Exactly. We make sure we're all on the same page. We bring up Mrs. Patient on the console, and then my partner goes to get Mrs. Patient. And then like we just mentioned that we've identified that, you know, maybe I haven't met her before. And so I'm going to ask her, her name. Maybe she looks like, maybe we have patients that look alike or maybe have similar names. So we want to check <clears throat> that we do have Mrs. Patient in the room and Mrs. Patient pulled up on the console. Very good. Another, one other way that we talked about timeouts in previous, previous presentations, but at the console, when we check our MUs or check the treatment plan, it, you know, maybe if, you know, it's a hectic day and the wrong patient is pulled up on the console, but I have my, my PDF of the treatment plan. When I check the MUs, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, we have Mrs. Patient on the table and I have Mrs. Patient's plan in my hand, then I'm reading the MU numbers to my coworker who is on the console, they're going to check that the MUs match the MUs that I'm expecting to see. And that should match too, because the MUs are never going to be the same from patient to patient. So that's another way to catch, you know, this would be right before treatment that we're catching it, but an MU check. I, I've had students say, why do we have to check the MUs every day? It's always the same. It's never going to change. And it's like, yes, that's true. The MUs aren't going to change because the plan's not going to change. Well, unless there's a change in the home. But, but the MUs aren't going to change from day to day. But this is also one way to catch that we have the right plan pulled up on the console, checking that we have the correct patient and the correct plan. So it sounds like it's important to catch these errors before they harm the patient. What can we do about this? Very good question. I'm glad you asked that. We're going to spend the next half of the lecture talking about error prevention. This is kind of a pun. Safety is no accident. Yes, we're talking about having a culture of safety. So being safe means that we have no accident, but it could also mean that we have safety not by accident, that it is intentional, that we are very thoughtfully creating our processes or doing our work on purpose very intentionally so that we don't have access. This report was done by one of the cancer centers and they kind of categorize the different 
failures that happened in IMRT. And it's really interesting to look at these ones kind of fall under the wheelhouse of the radiation therapist. We've got communication. Now this is not, you know, fully on the therapist, but this is where like the human interactions come into play. Communication, training, SOPs, and just, you know, we're human and we make mistakes. But a large part of this percentage of errors are things that we, they're a little bit harder to control. So we're going to talk about, it's called a Swiss cheese model of accident causation, how to prevent errors at the departmental level, at the individual level, an error reporting system, and developing your own safety checklist. So this professor in, I believe in the UK, came up with this model, a conceptual model of preventing errors. And he thought of it like Swiss cheese, the systems that we put into place, like each slice of cheese blocks errors from coming through, but human systems are fallible. Sometimes, you know, there are blind spots. So in, in this model, the holes in the Swiss cheese represent the mistakes or failures or things in that layer that, that might not catch an error. So the idea is that you have your different systems, different layers of workflow of error prevention. And the thought is that, or the hope is that each of the different layers would have their Swiss cheese holes in a different place. So in this layer, an error might slip through. And in this layer, that hole might also not catch that error, but in this layer, there's no hole in the same place. So, you know, by having these different layers of cheese, the, the holes don't line up and we're able to prevent an error to to pass through. This model kind of is, it's using more of a, a systems view of error prevention <clears throat> rather than just saying, you know, it's, it's because so-and-so didn't do their job. We wanna create a workflow that prevents errors. So in, in radiation therapy, it might be, you know, our layers of cheese might be a peer review, physics check, the RTT check, machine QA, and hopefully these catch the errors that prevent will prevent harming the patient. But if errors do occur, the, the concept here in the Swiss cheese model is that the holes happen to accidentally line up and then all of these blocks that are designed to catch errors happen to all line up with their with the failures to not catch an error and then the harm would reach the patient. Someone asked if MLC is not working, can we treat a patient? No, that would be like, if you don't have, if you're using Cerebend blocks, if you don't have a block, you don't have a beam shape. Yeah, you, you have no way of shaping your field. So it sounds like even though there were checks in place, some errors still go through. What can we do to prevent this? We can, good question. We could add more cheese. The, with the uh, introduction of this, with more advanced technology, the systems are so complex. We need to make sure that we keep up with our quality assurance. When you, when you introduce a new planning system or a new workflow, you want to adjust and adapt to this new technology and very thoughtfully add more, add more things that, that could catch errors. So education, all these, you know, you can add the idea is that add more systems to hopefully stop errors from reaching the patient. And each of those layers are going to have their holes in different places. A hypothetical example. Oh, actually, I think I can, in the interest of time, I can. Okay. So talking about error prevention at the departmental level, I'm just going to talk about some examples. And these, this is not an exhaustive list. This is just to get you thinking. The concept of the Swiss cheese model is that we want to have systems in place to catch mistakes. So for example, policies would be like morning QA has to be done on the machine every day before you treat a patient. So you have to check your beam symmetry that your lasers and um, your isocenter is correct. All of our equipment is correct before we treat a patient. So another example of a, a QA, part of your QA program in your department is that you must run a quality assurance plan on an IMRT plan before you treat a patient. It has to treat, it has to pass the QA there. Another example is requiring 
two therapists to be present at all times involved in the treatment. Having mandatory stops in place, like the physician must approve the contours before planning even begins, um, those kind of things. So on a department level, what are, your, what are your requirements? What are your policies that you want to have in place? Automation is the best way to eliminate human error. I might like for myself have a mental checklist of uh, things that I check. Let's say I'm doing a chart check, but I've seen one clinic, they have actually, a, they wrote a software program that will check, they'll, it, they'll run through like their, their plan and their parameters and things and, and it will automatically check if the, it'll kind of do an initial treatment chart check. I know that in, in our, our dosimetrists or physicists have a automated plan checker. So they, when they, when they finish making a plan, there's, they have a mental list, a checklist of, did I, you know, of all the things, did I do this? Did I do that? But they haven't, they have it automated. So that way, you know, let's say you get distracted and you accidentally miss one of the items on the checklist. So they have a little program that checks all of those things. The trick about doing automated automated checks is that you have to design that very carefully and to make sure you catch everything. And for the things that you can't automate, then you should have a standard workflow. And by this, I don't mean, you know, one person decides this is how we're going to do it because I like to do it this way. But as a team, you agree, this is the best practice. We should make sure we check the bolus before we leave the room, or we should chart a certain way so that everyone's on the same page, everyone knows what's going on, there's no confusion. When we transfer the, the simulation notes to, I work in ARIA, so we, we type in the setup notes for immobilization. We have a standard way of writing it. We always put the site that we're treating first, and then we, we have an order that we list what immobilization devices and then we talk about, then there's a mention of, is there gating? Is there bolus? Are we imaging? And there's just a, a standard order. That way, everyone's on the same page. We write it the same way. We read it the same way. And there's clarity and no confusion. <laughs> Another plus for having written standard operating procedures is, one, it's very useful for training. When you have new people come on board, you have it written so that they can, they can read it read your policy. And the other thing is for accountability, that if heaven forbid a mistake happens, well, did that person follow the procedure? And the idea is not so much to penalize the person, but the idea is that we are writing things in a, in a we have a system. And if we follow the system, does the system catch, you know, prevent errors? And it also, well, a benefit of having a standard way of doing things is that you're not, you know, everybody likes to do things a little bit differently and you're not going to have to say, well, my way is better than your way. It's just, this is the way it's written and we're going to do it this way and nobody's going to argue. A well-designed checklist can ensure that an item isn't forgotten. Is it possible to treat palliative cases if MLC is not working? It would depend on your plan. If your if the treatment plan is to have an open field, you're not using the MLC. I don't think I think the interlocks it won't it wouldn't. I think it wouldn't work. Like the machine won't it won't allow you to treat if not all of the things are are working well. I mean, if everything is working properly. Yeah. Regarding this last question that the man asked about that, can they treat this patient if the MLCs are not working? So. I think that's the incident that you showed us in in the past couple of past slides. That gentleman who got injury. Exactly the same case. If you are you know that MLCs are not working, and even then you are treating a patient, it means that you are exposing more. Because IMRT uses like I think it's six or seven times more am used to deliver that same dose as compared to 3D CRT or like we met. So I think if the MLCs are not working, even your patient is like palliative or curative, you shouldn't treat that thing. Or otherwise, you need to change your IMRT plan to see uh, uh, 3D CRT and discuss it with your physician first. That's my, I think, uh, suggestion. Yeah. Yes, I agree. You're absolutely correct. I, I wasn't sure if it... So IMRT or anything with blocking, 
you absolutely need your MLC. You otherwise you're not blocking your field. But some I, I wasn't sure if the question meant like if you were if it's a palliative field and you're just doing open field, just a rectangle, the MLCs that in that case are not involved. But yeah, absolutely. If you have any kind of beam shaping, whether it's 3D or IMRT, anything that uses the MLC for blocking, if your MLCs aren't working, you you can't do the treatments. You're not going to deliver the plan that that is designed for that patient. Yes, thank you for that clarification. Sir Reason here uh, had this quote, we cannot change the human condition, but we can change the conditions under which humans work. So for your error prevention at the departmental level, um, you can design your workflow to help us as humans, because we're fallible, but help us to be less likely to make mistakes. You want your workflow to be streamlined. So I, I couldn't find good therapy examples. So this is a kitchen example. So, so in this situation, you know, the person is going all over the kitchen to get material, like forget I, I need a fork and walk over here and then, oh, I need salt. It's over there. And oh, I need, you know, and they're running all over the place. But if you have your workspace designed, you know, in a logical, a logical manner where your equipment is where you need it to be, and it's just, it's much, it's much quicker, it's much faster, things are very clear, you're not going to forget anything, all, all of your stuff, you you know, you want your workflow to be, to be streamlined, you want your workflow to be efficient, and that would do the same thing where you're, you're not running all over the place with trying to get material here and there and you might forget something and you go over there and another sorry this is a kitchen example but when you're designing I'm, I'm talking about designing error prevention you want it to be efficient um, this is a bad example sorry but it's from the kitchen so let's say you're measuring salt so I'm going to measure in a measuring cup so if I want to make sure I don't make a mistake am I going to measure again using a food scale to make sure I have the same the, a correct amount of salt now, do I really gain anything by measuring the salt twice in two different ways? Well, yes and no, but is that really, is that, you know, just think about if the design for my error prevention is something that actually, is it just creating extra work or is it something that's actually going to stop a meaningful error? If, is it going to cause more chaos? Is it going to cause more steps? Because the more complex your your checking system is that itself in itself reduce, per, introduces places where mistakes can occur. And your error prevention design needs to be effective. Using the, the kitchen example, I might have very carefully measured the salt, but did I have any, do I have anything that checks if I use salt and not sugar? So in designing your systems, does my safety check actually stop the error from reaching the patient? At the departmental level, you want to be, you want to have an organized environment. You know, who wants to work? Who wants to work where everything's a big mess? It's just nice and clean. You know, this picture on the left, it's it's nice and clean, it's organized. I, I don't have distractions. And you want to minimize multitasking. This is a misconception that that you should be able to do many things at the same time because it's, it's really not, it, it really doesn't work. I shouldn't be treating a patient and then answering the phone or, or checking charts and trying to schedule at the same time. And you also want to minimize distractions while you're treating a patient, especially when you're, you're, you're trying to enter your treatment parameters and a nurse comes and wants to talk about a situation with a certain patient. You, you don't want to be interrupting the therapist while they're doing their safety check. We call this a, a sterile cockpit when we're when we're flying or <laughs> flying the console. We don't we don't want somebody to come by and have a conversation with me during a crucial point. So once your department has systems in place to prevent errors, it also comes down to individual responsibility and error prevention on an individual level. So when we're one of these, again, these are just examples or there could be more things in this list. Preventing errors obviously involves having your staff be trained and knowledgeable. This would be things like how to use the equipment properly. How, am I, do I know how to move the height of my image receptor so I don't collide it with the table? Do I know how to collimate my 
when I'm taking an image, so I'm irradiating less of the patient. And, and knowledge, this would be like the example of, let's say, the, the breast patient issue. Does the therapist understand that there should be a wedge in place? So I should know what is happening, what should be happening in order to stop it if something doesn't look right. The MLCs, I should know that the MLCs should be moving during IMRT treatment or that the gantry should be rotating during a VMAT treatment. If I didn't know that and the, in this example, and the MLCs are, are not moving during treatment, if I didn't know that, I wouldn't have stopped the treatment. Then human factors, we are human. Uh, we, things happen in our lives. You know, we might be tired and maybe I have a lot going on. I'm not being a little sleep. I'm coming to work. I'm tired. Or maybe there's personal stress or, you know, just, just plain human fact, human factors of, you know, distractions happen. So being aware of like, maybe I'm having an off day. I know I'm, I'm tired. I would say, you know, to my coworker, Hey, I, I don't trust myself today. Can you double check me? Make sure, you know, this doesn't remove any responsibility from me, but if, if I let my coworker know, just be extra alert, please, because I, you know, I want to make sure that we don't make a mistake. Or maybe, maybe you need to step away and take your 15 minute break and just kind of rest, clear your mind, and then come back to work fresh. But just, you know, be aware of yourself that maybe, maybe I'm not, you know, operating a hundred percent to, to try to be extra diligent. And on an individual level, your individual professional ethics, this is your, your, your individual integrity that, that we are following the SOPs. We're doing best practices. We're not taking shortcuts. If we have a question, like let's say we're image matching and you know, I, I wanna always ask my coworker, do you agree with my image match? Am I looking at the right thing? Am I on the right vertebral body? Just an extra set of eyes. Am I texting on my phone during treatment? Those kind of things should never happen. So this is this is in the area of personal professional ethics. Take a little breather here. The what I want to emphasize when we talk about when we were in the the lecture on IMRT workflow changes, I just want to talk a little bit about the roles of the RTTs. So we like to have two therapists at all times. One is the, we say pilot and co-pilot. So one person is operating the console and taking the images, et cetera. And the other person's role is to do the charting. In this case, it's paper charting or electronic charting. But both of them are responsible for the treatment. So instead of saying pilot and co-pilot with, you know, obviously roles that you're playing, but both of them, I like to say driver and backseat driver. So the, the person that's not doing the driving should be looking over the shoulder of the person who's doing the driving, checking, you know, agreeing, you know, are, the, are we on the right, are, are we on the correct image match? Is, are the machine parameters correct? We're both checking the MUs, checking that the patient name is correct, all of those things. And then, you know, Two pairs of eyes are better than one because you're both going to be looking at, are the MLCs moving? You're watching the patient. Is the patient vomiting? So both of you are looking at all of these things at the same time, not both of you watching the MLC or both of you watching the patient. You're both, like your eyes are always moving around, looking at all of these things, um, hoping that between the two of you, you're going to catch something and say, stop, stop the treatment. We've got a problem. So let's say I discover that an error has occurred. What should we do? That's a really good question. It depends on the, the timing of the, like, did you catch it before it happened or did you catch it and stop it with the patient on the table? But generally you're going to call your physicist and your doctor over to determine the next steps on what they're going to, what they decide how they're going to manage it. If it's something that like, let's say one treatment of the breast was missing a wedge, but let's say it's the first treatment. They can they can calculate and kind of make up for those kind of errors, but that that will have to that that's decided on the physician and the physicist level of what they want to do. Or let's say the machine breaks down on the last fraction, and so then the the doctor can decide. Well, you know, we can we can just stop the treatment here 
or we want the patient to come back on another day or those kind of things will be decided at the doctor and physicist level, but we definitely want to let them know what's going on. Now, heaven forbid, you know, we, an error happens to the patient. You wanna have in your department an error reporting system. What is an error reporting system? It's, it's where you collect information on errors and near misses because there's a lot of good information because you wanna check that your systems are able to catch these errors. So even if the patient wasn't harmed, we're like, oh, this could have harmed the patient. So we can go back and look at our processes and design them differently if we need to. So you're gonna take this data, what is the data used for? It's gonna to go to, you can call it different things, the QA committee, and they're gonna analyze the who's on the committee, this should be interdisciplinary. You should have um, at least one person from each modality, a, a physician, a physicist, a dosimetrist, a nurse, a therapist, and management. But every, there should be representation from every area of the department to analyze the findings. You're going to look at, well, was this a uni unique event or is this a pattern? How and why did the event occur? And look for, was there a weakness in our process or a system? Is there a hole in the cheese we need to is there a way we can patch up the hole? And then what can be done to prevent this from happening again? And this would be where they, we call those corrective action recommendations. This whole process is not for blaming or shaming an individual. We're approaching this error prevention from a systems perspective. You know, are there holes in our cheese? Do we have adequate workflows, adequate policies to prevent errors? What are some corrective action recommendations that you have? Ah. Oh. Good question. So for example, the, the breast example I'll use, you know, what if we didn't have a written standard operating, operating position, procedure for breast treatments where you check if there's a wedge before you leave the room or checking the charts before, you know, having, we call it a timeout. So checking all your parameters before you beam on, that would be an example from, from what we had here. Oh, I'm running out of time. This, this, the stuff on this slide right here, this could be a whole entire course. The concepts come from actually manufacturing. And if you want to Google lean manufacturing, or it's called continuous improvement, Toyota production systems, process improvement, this, this, that's kind of the, where this comes from. It's comes from manufacturing and it's translated into healthcare. I, I'll have some resources in the, in the ending slides for you. One thing I want to caution when you're doing corrective actions is that you want to, you want to, you don't want to make things the solution more complex than the actual process because when every time you introduce more complexity then you know you can introduce more places that mistakes occur. On your committee, like I said, you should have subject matters Subject matter experts should have input and what I mean by that is that when you have a corrective action it shouldn't be just let's say the manager making a declaration that the therapist is going to do X, Y, Z, because we need to test if that's actually going to work. Is it going to catch the error? What does it do? How does that impact your, the therapist's workflow? You don't want to do a knee-jerk reaction. This happens. So, you know, I'm going to just make this policy. You need to use data. You need to think through it thoughtfully. Huh, that's, sorry, that's, <laughs> It needs to be a thoughtful process. You need to use data to design and test it. And like I said, your workflows should maintain, you should keep it simple, straightforward, and efficient. Very quickly, Ben asked, how can a therapist identify a missing wedge before or during treatment? So we're talking about, let's say we have automated plan upload, which we do now with, if obviously if you have IMRT, the treatment plan is just automatically loaded up. You should have, the therapist should be provided a PDF, either you know paper or a PDF document of the treatment plan with all of the parameters, with the beam angles. So in your timeout, the therapist is gonna be looking at the, you know, what are the fields before I, before I beam on, I'm gonna look at on the console, do I have the correct fields? Do I have the correct MUs? Does it have the correct, you know, is a wedge in there. So you're looking at your PDF and then you're looking at the console. And if it says wedge, you should see a wedge in the console. In the case of, if there's a, well, if there's a wedge missing in the plan, 
that should be caught in the initial chart check before the patient even comes for treatment. Then the therapist's going to say, I have a breast tangent. I should see a wedge in there. And I don't see a wedge in the plan. So they, they should call a physicist and say, uh, is there supposed to be a wedge? Did, was this a mistake that you forgot? The now I'm going to say there's an exception because there are techniques now using field and field with breasts and it doesn't use a wedge, but instead it uses the MLC. So in that case, there wouldn't be a wedge, but that's, that's another, <laughs> that's another topic. So we were requested for some example checklists because we've been talking about checklists and I'm running out of time here. So I'm just going to go through this really quickly. So the checklist that we were going to send to you, I think we have it on the Google Drive. It's only going to be talking about these areas where the therapist's workflow touch in the whole radius therapy workflow. And when you, when you go to develop your checklist, you should think through at each step of the workflow, what are the things that you can check or what, what kind of errors you can catch. And so at simulation, do you have the correct patient? Do you have the correct site that is being planned for? What are the physician orders, et cetera? Initial chart check before you even get the patient in. Like I said, is, does the plan look correct? Is it the correct site? Does it match the consent? Does it match the prescription? Does the dose match? Is, are all the safety checks done? Did the physician approve the plan? The, did the physics do their second check? Did the physics department do their QA? Are my treatment notes entered correctly, et cetera, et cetera? Sorry, I'm going to have to rush through these. First and daily treatments, they're very similar. Yeah. Again, you know, the, all of the above. And then you're going to check if your machine parameters were uploaded correctly. Do I have the correct immobilization? Do I have the bolus on? Does the field, am I looking with my eyes? Does the field look correct? What am I checking before the patient gets on the table? What am I checking at the console? Sorry, I'm going to rush through this, but I, I think as experienced therapists, I think you have an idea of what things you want to have in your checklist. So checklists are a helpful tool. However, you want to avoid overkill because if it's too long, it's going to take too much time. People are going to gloss over it. They might skip things. And also if your procedures are too complex, people can make mistakes. So that's, that's kind of a lot to do all in one, in one hour. <laughs> but Having a culture of safety, we are the last stop. The therapist is the last stop in preventing an error from reaching the patient. So we, when we introduce computerization and automation, some of the things are easier in that the, like, for example, we don't have to manually enter the MUs, the field size and all of that stuff. It's automatically entered to the computer and the treatment will run automatically. But, you know, we shouldn't forget our fundamental practices of, constantly monitoring the patient and the machine and doing our visual checks, um, making sure that things are running correctly as we are doing the treatment. So we, we need to know what should be happening in order to ensure that the patient is receiving uh, what is planned. So just running over the key points, with great power comes great responsibility. We have the ability to put systems in place at the departmental level and um, at the individual level, we take uh, personal initiative to make sure that we don't allow mistakes to hit the patient. You want to have um, an error reporting system for your clinic and that when designing all of the above, you just want to be thoughtful and um, design it carefully. And are there any questions at this point? Hello, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, ma'am. My name is Abraham from Nigeria. In your presentation, you mentioned that two therapies must be at the console. But I want you to take note of one thing. It varies from center to center. In some center, they have what you call bad policy. And it says that instead of the normal eight working hours, these same two therapies that work from morning they work beyond eight hours. They mm -hmm. work up to 10 hours, 12 hours in a day. And these same mm -hmm. two therapists will come back to work the following day. Uh. So you can imagine the number of stress, the number of mistakes, errors that will come in. So these are the things that should be taken into consideration next time. Thank you, God bless you. This would be something addressed at the, I guess, departmental level. We work eight hour shifts. 
And when, in order to cover the day, we have, you know, the morning team and the afternoon team. By law, we have, uh, you know, 30 minute lunch and 15 minute breaks. But yeah, that is a very good point because that introduces you're tired. Yeah. The, the two therapist thing is actually an ACR certification requirement. It's not by law. I know some countries do require two therapists at all times, but I, I think in our area, it's, it's not a requirement, but if you want ACR certification, it is one of the criteria. But yeah, staffing, staffing is a whole nother consideration. And that is a very, very important thing that you, you're going to be tired. Yes, I, I agree. Definitely.